had this thought of, okay, Ubuntu, I am because we are, and we are because I am. And I stopped and I cried. That might sound like a simple shift in phrasing, but coming from someone who has lived a life of not living up to unrealistic expectations of others and not feeling enough, when I switched that to, okay, Ubuntu, I am because we are, and we are because I am, I innately felt the value that I bring into humanity and the groups and the relationship. And it expanded upon this original foundation uh, idea to, I am enough, like I'm more than enough. And the value that I bring is needed and it's worthy and it's wanted. And so that's the reciprocation that Ubuntu has brought me in, um, you know, just recently. Welcome back to this chapter of the Business Library. Today I have Aragorn. We're going to be talking about one of my favorite subjects, human connection, how the human brain works, and just how he describes himself, I think is, is fascinating. Um, like an optimistic and thoughtful leader. Get into that in a second. Because this episode is sponsored by a new free course, which is down below. And of course, all of Eric's links are down there as well. So if you hear something you like, go down there, check it out. Don't forget to. So Eric, like, what does it mean to be an optimistic and thoughtful leader? I have my own idea, but what does it mean to you? It's such a great question, because a lot of people see optimism as those who bring false hope or those who are, you know, not living and breathing in the real world. Um, to me, being an optimist and a thoughtful leader, it means approaching every situation with a mindset that is focused on potential and growth. All right. So it's the understanding that there are no failures. If there is a failure, it's because you gave it permission to be so. Otherwise, those explorative aspects in our lives that didn't end up the way that we wanted them to become our greatest teachers and stepping stones to growth and expansion. So to expand a little more on that is once we have that understanding, to me, an optimist is someone who has the ability to uh, have someone come to them and once they hear any self-negative talk. So for example, if Someone comes to me and they say, and we're talking and they're like, ah, I'm just not smart enough to understand that. It's my ability to say, you know what? You know what I see? I see someone who is a genius in these avenues and pointing out the things that I admire about them. And it's only going to take a matter of time for you to understand this the way that I understand it because I've studied it for a really long time. So ultimately what I'm doing is I'm offering them a different lens to see themselves through. And that's the, that's to me, the core of optimism is in this world, we tend to see the world through one or two lenses, the, the world of things that we don't want and the world of things that we do want. And a lot of times we go into this negative connotation of saying, I don't, when I go to work, uh, I don't want it to be as busy as last time. I don't want to deal with these people. I well, of course, it's going to be as busy. You're going to deal with these people because you're going to be creating opportunities to practice what you're putting out there. And instead, man, I'm going to have an amazing shift. I'm going to impact so many lives and I'm going to have awesome conversations. Well, that's exactly what you're going to have. So offering a different lens, a different set of glasses for them to see the other side of the coin. That, that to me is optimism. And to be able to understand that within yourself to then offer that onto someone else becomes the thoughtful leader um, that is expressing that optimism onto someone else. I love the example you gave from work because it's definitely something I can relate to because I've practiced this many times myself in, oh, I don't really just feel like it. Um, and a, if you had a bad day before and all of those negative thoughts, but you can really just switch it around by mm -hmm. view, how to view like view the things differently view mm -hmm. like find like something positive in it um, 
you can always find something positive. The only reason why you define negatives is that's what you're looking for. If you look for the positive, you find the positives. Yeah. Uh, I did like an experiment with this back when I was in management. And I, because it was something about you, you had to acknowledge your employees whilst I was doing like a training. So I said to myself, I'm going to come up with one positive thing for one person a day. That was, I didn't want to overdo it. And all of a sudden, I found a lot of positive things because that was what I was looking for. I'm just like saying that to, to, to underline the point. Would you say there is something like too optimistic? Does that exist in your world? Um, that is a very good question. And, and I don't think it's too optimistic. I think it's um, maybe portraying that off onto other people. So there's times where we are dealing with trauma um, at such a core level that if, if optimism is brought to you during that time, we don't really have the capacity to see that other lens because we are hurt so bad. So I think there's a balance mm. of maybe not too optimistic, but the wrong timing of maybe they need to be connected. Like maybe they need to feel seen, heard, and valued because they're lacking the basic foundations of what they need to feel like a human. So maybe the human connection piece is missing. And so therefore it can come across as maybe a toxic optimism or too much optimism. Um, but I, I know from like my, my story, uh, my wife shifted my perspective because uh, I worked in a pediatric hospital. There's goodness everywhere, right? There, I mean, that's why I worked with kids. That's why I picked that because of the goodness. And my wife one day, like I was burned out, didn't know who I was, didn't recognize myself in the mirror. And she's like, hey, look for something good tonight when you go into work because it's there. And at the time, it seemed like, that's way too optimistic. Like there's nothing good there. No, there was amazing things there. And it changed my life by switching that one little thought. So I, I had the privilege of having someone already connected with me offer this optimism. So I think it depends on the relationship in which it comes. Hopefully, hopefully that made sense and answered your question. It, it's a, it's a very good point. Um, because it, it kind of, it really comes down to to who says it a, a big part unless you have very good situational awareness because uh, most of the time it people that are, are too optimistic or, or do something like other annoying that they, they don't do it to annoy you they just their situational awareness in that moment yeah apparently it's the working for whatever reason <laughs> right 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 you introduced me to this wonderful saying, and I'm going to read it off the screen because I don't want to fuck it Absolutely. up. Um, I am because we are. The first question I had when I read that sentence, that what the hell does that mean? <laughs> you said it was oh. powerful, so I believe you. Yes. Yes. So this phrase underlines the foundation of everything I do in life. It was introduced to me at a time where I was transforming into who I needed to become. Ultimately, it's from a South African term um, pronounced Ubuntu, and it roughly translates to I am because we are. Okay, there's many facets behind this, but ultimately what it says is every connection, every interaction, every experience I've had with, an with another human being from then till now has shaped who I am. So I am me because of the whole. Um, uh, someone, someone described it as the plural of humanity. So we see humanity as ourselves a lot of times, and this is offering the plural view of all of us. So to take this one step further, this is what drew me into the power of Ubuntu. From leadership. Um, this is where the concept comes in. So in South Africa, in, in, you know, they have these tribes. So smaller communities than what we would see in, in major cities. However, if one of the tribe members messes up, if they do not live up to an expectation or whatever the case may be, as humans, we have a tendency to go down these negative rabbit holes of, I could have done better, how dare me, like 
the self-sabotaging conversations that we have internally. What Ubuntu offers is place this person in the middle. Everyone in the tribe surrounds them and they start telling them the value and beauty and love that they bring to the community. So if, if you were the one, let's say that, that messed up, you would be in the middle. And when it came to me, I would say, man, I love how you can flip my perspective when I need it. And we would go around until you heard enough to where now you don't feel powerless. You have your power back and you know where you fit in the culture. So from a leadership realm, how many times do we actually hear how well, we, how well we're doing? And on top of that, do we ever hear it when we mess up? Or is it always the negative rabbit hole of the verbal warnings, the write up, the on and on and on? How much more powerful would it be if we brought this human connection to say, hey, look, I don't know what's going on. I want you to know I care for you. You're valued. And this is what you bring to the team. So whatever's going on, like if you need help, ask. If not, forgive yourself because we forgive you. And let's, let's move on so you can enhance this team. And ultimately, that is the very short of, of Ubuntu and, and this bigger, huge understanding of, of what it represents. I'm curious of because I see like it's powerful and and the power of it, like how you have implemented Ubuntu into your own life and utilized it. I appreciate the question. Um, so, for in coaching, for example, when when I have a client that is struggling to see their own value. I innately connect with, hey, this is this is what I've seen you do in my life. Like, this is how you've helped me. So back to that story of my wife saying, hey, look for something good at work. I got to work and heard her voice before I walked into a patient's room. And I was met with a four-year-old with Down syndrome who had nothing to give me except for love. And it was the first time I can remember being given love unconditionally without the constraints of family or the current understanding of what love is. And that to me is the, my ability to like give that back. So if, if this person ever comes back and is like struggling with things, I have the ability to say, look, you helped change my life. This is the value that you offered. And, and that value never leaves you. It's on and on. You might be struggling now, but this is what happens. And in this understanding, I went for a hike. This was like uh, less than a month ago. I went for a hike and clearing my head. And um, I had this thought of, okay, Ubuntu, I am because we are. And we are because I am. And I stopped and I cried. That might sound like a simple shift in phrasing, but coming from someone who has lived a life of not living up to unrealistic expectations of others and not feeling enough, when I switched that to, okay, Ubuntu, I am because we are, and we are because I am, I innately felt the value that I bring into humanity and the groups and the relationship. And it expanded upon this original foundation uh, idea to I am enough, like I'm more than enough. And the value that I bring is needed and it's worthy and it's wanted. And so that's the reciprocation that Ubuntu has brought me in, um, you know, just recently. So apparently I've implemented something similar. Uh, one thing I learned back in, in management was when it comes to critique or feedback, however you want to word it, lead with something positive and preferably also end with something positive because then people are open to what you're going to say and they're going to have a positive memory of it. So it's going to stick. Correct. That's the, so, so the, the, the sandwich approach, right? The, the sandwich approach, right? The, yep. The positive. I've been of... what? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I like it. I like it. And I'm curious, how well little, was it received? It's a little bit different. Um, 
or people did quite quite enjoy it. Um, I was it, it kind of came to a pro, like a point where it was a problem in the team because it became a thing where it was only me that was able to give to get the team to achieve extraordinary results because yeah. everybody would work harder for me than anybody else. So I think sometimes it messed up the plan because I I got I got like when I came back Monday I got this reboot of like everything and everything how everything went bad and then like the next weekend where it was me that had the control and it was on the floor I was like but this was a breeze I don't know what the other people are complaining about like they say all these people but I don't have any problems so it like it it had very good results so good results nice. it actually became a, became a little problem. Nice, but it is nice. very powerful. Um, uh, and I, I do especially like how instead of focusing on the negative, you focus on like you, by putting a people in a circle, you, you focus on the positive. <laughs> um, because I, like our nature as people, like ninety percent of us are gonna critique ourselves a lot worse than anybody ever could. Yes. So yes. we have understood the lesson. We know what went wrong. That went through our brain. There's no need to like dig in that. Let's go positive. Yeah. And and I heard this interesting story, and I'll let you you speak a little bit afterwards and ask you a question. No, go so for just it. The, I'm, I'm intrigued. Mass podcast. Uh, who was it? I think it was um, the guy that runs Valuetainment. I actually can't remember his name for the life of me, um, but he runs a podcast Valuetainment on the channel here on YouTube. And he talked about the difference in like top five athletes and top 25 athletes because they're all equally as good or nearly equally as good. The top five athletes, they had positive thoughts after 20 minutes of any mistake happening. They, in, like, they nearly instantly went, okay, I analyzed what went wrong and let's focus on just how we can do that better, how I can uh, achieve greatness, where other people would start creeping in like self-doubt. Um, so interesting. I know it's not in the script, but now we're talking about self doubt. Like, <laughs> yeah, how do you help people deal with that? Because you're a coach, so it's relevant for sure. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's, it's self doubt always comes down to a disbelief or a misunderstanding of something that's happened, um, you know, in the past that has culminated into something that feels huge right now. So, whether someone is struggling in finding a new job elevating themselves in the um, in their current job, enhancing their marriage, becoming a better parent, whatever it is, it's identifying that blockage. So that self-doubt, um, what I find to be amazing, and this sounds so like easy, and it's one of the hardest things I ever did, was uh, standing in front of a mirror and saying, I'm enough, looking myself in the eyes and saying it until I believed it. And it took a really long time. Um, because until we're able to connect, because, um, uh, uh, Louise Hay calls it mirror work. And if anyone out there, if you have not read or listened to anything from Louise Hay, it is one of the most beautiful human beings, uh, you can listen to. Um, and so she helped. So with these affirmations, it's charging someone with the ability to make their first human connection with themselves. And the mirror allows you to see that. And it it allows you to tap into where that disbelief is coming from. So that self-doubt, chances are that's not your voice. That is someone else's voice that you took on as true. So it starts with identifying, okay, I am enough. And from there, how do we rewrite the narrative and how do we flip this script? to what we want to find as opposed to what we've been finding, which is not what we want to see. Um, and it, it begins with that. And that's one of the most powerful tools I have witnessed and used uh, in both personal and, and um, in coaching sessions as well. Yeah. It's, I've never done it in front of a mirror. But I have like oh, those sessions where you sit there and you talk with yourself. And mm -hmm. there's a difference in saying it out loud and, and thinking it. Mm -hmm. 
it becomes it hits in a in a whole different way. You can kind of feel it moving around on your body. At least I can. It probably feels different to everybody. I, I would imagine at least. So when it comes into like self doubt, because you didn't mention that is like this voice in here, and this is an episode mm -hmm. about about human connections. It, how do we build those connections that's going to help us in the Ubuntu way um, and not create more self-doubt? Absolutely. And fascinating question. And it's kind of a twofold process. So the, the first part of that is realizing that if we're seeking, um, you know, there's, there's all kinds of sayings like when the, when the student is ready, the teacher will appear. Well, in that, in that quote alone is saying the student is not seeking out the teacher. The student is prepping the mind and the environment for the teacher to arrive. So from that understanding, it's if you focus on the internal work and becoming aligned with yourself, all of a sudden you will start seeing these people pop into your, your social feed. And that's what happened with me. Wayne Dyer was one of the first people that I'm like, who the heck is Wayne Dyer? And now I'm like, Wayne Dyer is one of the most amazing people who have trans helped transform my life. And I share that wisdom with others. So that I think is, is step one is identifying and understanding, okay, I have to get right within me and shift my mindset. And to, to add on to the mindset and the, I love the, I love the story that you shared because there's an, there's another analogy to this um, that like uh, Olympic athletes, this is the perfect time since the Olympics are on. Uh, Olympic athletes, when they're interviewed yeah. afterwards, they, they, they always ask them, so were, were you nervous before you started? And they're like, no, I was excited. Well, fascinating thing is almost the exact same chemicals are released into the body if you're nervous or you're excited. It's the same feeling that the body has. The only difference is how we respond to those chemical the, that chemical cocktail. So if we, re, if we respond, like we feel this adrenaline and we're like, oh my God, what if I don't do good? You're going down a negative rabbit hole that is going to make you smaller than what you actually are into the nervous phase. However, on the other side, if you feel that adrenaline and you identify that with, I'm getting ready to have the race of a lifetime and dang, I'm freaking excited. Let's go. I've prepared. I've done everything I can. Now I'm going to take this energy that my body is providing and we're going to win a world record here. So now we become excited. Same, same formula that our body's doing. It's how our mind interprets that. And it leads us into one or two different ways. So again, very similar to, to what you were saying about how we, you know, basically react or respond. And to take that one step farther, something I think is amazing is the understanding that if we have an incident or a situation or someone says something and it, and it hurts or like it creates a negative emotion in us, or we say something ourselves and two days later we have the realization, I shouldn't have said that. Okay. That's our baseline. So it took us two days, which is, and this is a non-judgment. It took us two days to realize that this happened. Well, during that two days, every time you thought about it, subconsciously or consciously, your body released the same chemicals. So if you're mad and angry and you have this release of negative angry um, chemicals, you're thinking about that. Every time you think about it, you have a new rush of these. So these are stress hormones that are toxic to our bodies that are not going to allow us to lead in this positive light. So now we've, we've two days. Now the next time it happens, it may be one day. Awesome. We cut this in half. The goal is to get it down to ultimately before, before the, the words leave our mouth and we have the thought, we're like, I'm not going to say that to the point to where I don't even think that anymore. Because after I say it, after I respond or react in anger, I have about 60 seconds worth of chemicals that are released. If I stop and breathe in a minute, those chemicals are gone. And now I'm back in my analytical mind and I'm back to homeostasis. Instead of living two days in fight or flight that I created by repeating the thought after another, after another. 
that's what we're getting to. And if, when we can get to that shift, self doubt's no longer a thing because we're not speaking self doubt into the into the ether. And if we are, we're learning. Dang, I shouldn't have said that. Okay, it's almost like all right, erase that. I'm going to pause for a second. I'm going to breathe these chemicals out. And then we're back into homeostasis. Let's get back into where we're going. And then now you're back on the track. And your refractory period went from two days to one minute. And you're like, dude, I'm winning. Ultimately, that is the process of getting rid of self-doubt is recognizing the thought first. So true. So true. And, and training that is very important. Yes. Um, one of the things that was hard for me when it came to training it was I have very much self-irony in my humor. And I will say a lot of things about myself and um, just as a joke um, because people find it entertaining. But it was filtering out when is it actually, when am I, when am I, when it, well, apparently a hard word, when am I intentionally and the deep down intentions, when are they humorous or when are they self-destructive? Mm -hmm. That was the most difficult part for me to learn personally. And it kind of comes with going for, at least for me, you, you go for something bigger, you find a purpose, you aim for something. Hmm. Uh, at least that's how I, a lot of times, pull myself out hmm. of the, the negative spiral before I go too far down it. So how do you... you Go out and find the purpose. You don't change every other month. Because that I've seen a lot of people do that. Yeah. Yeah, I think this is such a fascinating question because I think a lot of times, so for me, when I first thought of what is my purpose in life? It had to be grand. It had to like reach millions of people at one time and then I'm done. And then I learned to renegotiate and re-understand the terminology that I was using. So a purpose needs to be magnificent, but the key to understanding magnificent that the key to understanding the word magnificent um, is the fact that when I offer kindness to a stranger, when I allow my my wife, my partner to vent to me for something that I did. And I do not take that on as my own, but I'm there to support and work towards being better for us. When I listen to my kid or offer support, when I do these things, these are magnificent. These are pieces that help build someone else's life. So in essence, to me, going to find a purpose is beginning this journey and understanding that you will probably never reach the end of this journey. Like uh, Kobe Bryant told his daughters, have this dream. You know, the dream is what we want to get to. And in this case, he was talking about basketball and he said, get there before everyone else, be the last one to leave, work your tail off, work harder than anyone else there and pour yourself into this. And at one point you will realize the journey is actually the dream. So same way with this, we have a dream of, man, I want to change the world. All right, that's a huge dream. Let's go for it. And what you realize are the little connections that you make are not really that little. And it creates that Ubuntu spirit of, I'm passing on understanding and wisdom that I was, I learned through my loneliness of tra traversing a very similar path that this person may be going through, what tools and offerings can I give them to help bridge that gap or shorten that gap to where now they can start making impact and lead on their journey to find purpose? Because I don't, I don't think we ever actually identify a true purpose because to your point, it does change. And I believe it changes for one of two reasons. One, we're trying to find validation in external things. I've been there before many times. And so I'm like, oh, the new shiny object. This is going to bring value. This is going to this is going to revolutionize my world. And then once I get it or get close to it, I'm like, this has nothing. This is nowhere near what I thought it would be. And then the the second thing is 
as I learn new things and I expand and grow, I have a new understanding of the world and now I can see it clear and I have a bigger dream. And that bigger dream may be from changing the world to creating a community. And even though it doesn't sound bigger in terms of the tangible aspect of it, the impact is huge. And which from the business world goes back to smallest viable audience, goes back to finding your tribe, goes into the aspects of all of that, which I didn't understand when I first learned it until I got to a point where it's like, oh, that's what they meant by that. And then we continue to expand. Perfectly transitioned. Thank you very much for doing that for me. Because my next question was a little bit more business related. Since coaching, if you at least if you go and take a look, got to cut that bit out, maybe otherwise, going to hurt people's ears. If we, because if you go looking for coaches on LinkedIn, there's probably millions of them. So it's one of like the most competitive spaces. How do you Agreed. go out there and sign your first client without a nice track list? It's a very, very good question. And I think that is what a lot of us coaches find to be true is, you know, this um, differentiating value proposition. What does it look like from coaching? Because coaching has become that new word of sounds way better than consulting. Um, coaching at its core is based on creating an environment for someone to become empowered enough to make the changes he or she knows that they need to make. The answers are in them. Our job is to unlock that as coaches. So ultimately, to answer your question, I bring a blend of, of human-centric design, and this comes in many different ways. This can come from human design itself, which to me is one of the greatest abilities for us to get into alignment with who we are and to understand the signals that notify us when we're out of alignment. So back to that refractory period, if I feel frustrated, I know to stop and think what's causing my frustration and how do I go from frustration to satisfaction. So how, what is missing here? And it allows me automatically to shift mindset and not take anything personal. So from the coaching side, offering that to someone as a tool, um, another cool tool, I'll share this, uh, is the, is the one, three, one foundation. So, um, this is great in businesses, especially if you have complainers on your team that are just bringing nothing but complaints to you. If you set this up to have them come in and say, okay, all right, Eric, um, here's my one clear defined problem, right? I've defined it and you know, a, a problem well-defined is a problem half solved. So here's my clear, my one clear defined problem. Here are my three viable options. These are three things that I think we can do. However, this is the one thing I believe I can initiate right now. Automatically in this framework, we've shifted mindset from problem to solution. And now we can tap into our toddler genius brains and begin to cr create through curiosity. Um, so to answer your question, tools such as this to get people out of what they describe as being stuck because they're in these programs that aren't even their programs that are rerunning ultimately these paradigms that were set forth and have been running on autopilot for so long giving them the tool to say, here, tap into your genius self and you will see how powerful you are. Because um, like design thinking, for example, when you start that and you're able to tap into the, the curiosity aspect of your mind, like I feel like a genius because I'm like, oh my God, where do these ideas come from? Well, they're always there. We just don't give ourselves permission to do so. So, that would be what I would offer. I would offer permission for you to create your unapologetic potential through exploration 
And I mean, um, the, the toddler approach, if you ever watch a toddler learn to walk, they are awful when they start, right? They're so clumsy, they fall. Um, but we as adults, we never degrade them for falling. We cheer them on for taking a step and for trying. And eventually they start running. Well, why? Because they had support. They had a knowing inside of them that I'm going to do this. And they were given boundaries to work in. And ultimately that describes my, my coaching style. Ah, so you, you, you just coach big kids. <laughs> big kids. Actually, we're, we're all big kids. We're, <laughs> yes. Yeah. Big kids yeah. with uh, well, a, especially, more of um, a, a need for emotional intelligence. Yes. That's yeah. We just fall harder when we're, when we're bigger. This makes me want to ask me ask something before we end up here in regards to because we always say that men we're big kids like uh, uh, like loud thing go boom bang fast funny haha like that yeah. that's yeah, yeah. all it takes for a lot of us and how to like some extent like how is the how is the male and female brain different? Ooh, what a fascinating question. Um, okay. I don't know if I can answer this from a, a educational side. So I'm going to answer this in an energy and a spiritual side, if that's okay. For sure. Um, that's what because, I, I aim for. Okay, good. Good, because I believe that Okay, so I believe that our emotions, which I describe as energy and motion, are directly related to the thoughts and how we perceive those thoughts. So we have a thought, and those thoughts are coming in from our perceptions, so feeling, seeing, hearing, tasting, and then how do we perceive those? So back to the analogy of the Olympics. How do you perceive this? Nervous? Excited. So if I have an input... How am I perceiving that? And that is driving how I feel. And that feeling or emotion is going to drive me in the direction I need to go. So with that as a base, I believe that men and women offer a balance for one another because, because they both have each energy inside of them. I believe that it's a, um, it's, it's one is sometimes given permission to uh, be expressed more than the other. So women, for example, and that feminine energy, we will call it, is nurturing, inviting, creative. It is magnificent, right? But so is the male energy. That male energy is energetic. It can be sometimes loud. It can be um, kind of... What's the word I'm looking for? Um, uh, overbearing at times um, because it knows what needs to get done and it wants to be efficient and effective. So I love your question because now my mind is like, okay, it's not one or the other. It's how do we balance the two? Um, and, and I think that is the beauty of relationships is, so for example, like I have, I have uh, a lot of feminine energy from me, from learning human design, from learning human connectiveness. And that came from working in the human service industry as a nurse, as all these aspects. However, we have a culture that puts me as a, no, you can't cry. You have to be okay. You can't feel because that's what women do. And ultimately, it's the balance that creates the impeccable understanding of that value proposition of how we get that into the world. I really hope that answered your question. Mm. That's what, that's what came to and came through. For sure. Well, I, it's a big question. Then there's, especially when you go into like more the spiritual, spiritual side, it's, it's going to be different answers depending on who you ask. Right. And it's, well, it's also going to, it's going to depend that. on, it's, it's going to depend on like, um, like what past trauma and we've all had trauma. 
So I, you know, trauma can be from emotional trauma to physical trauma, sexual trauma, like all of these things are part of who we are and create the ability for us to interpret the world through our perceptions. So all of those are key aspects. So it's almost like the beginning of this conversation would be, as you asked, like, what is the difference, how difference in the way a man thinks and a female and a woman thinks. And then that begins to uncover a huge array of different questions. And then it becomes deeper and deeper. And then ultimately we're, to me, we're back to a cohesiveness of, you know, I think, I think women are smarter. I really do. I, in, um, because I think they follow their intuition way better than we as men do. Um, and they know, like, they know this is the answer. And this is what I found, especially those who are like, I'm so in touch with who I am. I'm unapologetically going to give myself to this world. And I mean, they're the badasses that are like leading the charge. And so I, I think, I think like I've learned tons from the way women think and the way that they interact with the world. And I think it's amazing. I think we have some work to do. I'll say that. Did it, there's, um, there's a lot of to learn. And I would imagine it's the same the other way around because it's, well, like we have, as you mentioned, like the same like traits. It's just in men, they're generally on this side, some of them, and some of them on this side. And in mm-hmm. females or women, it's not the way around. But, but mm-hmm. they're still there. And depending on, on who they are, there's going to be more or less. Right. This is a very, very long conversation if we start digging into this rabbit hole. Yeah, so yeah for sure. Start doing for sure. This, where, can, where can people check you out if they like what they heard today? They want to meet Eric, have a conversation with him, maybe get life coaching from him, or, or hear more about one of the amazing tools you shared. Yeah, absolutely. I appreciate that. Uh, LinkedIn is kind of the easiest place. Uh, I'm on there um, not as much as I used to, starting to get more... Uh, presence there. Uh, that's my social media of choice, also on Facebook. And um, you can check out my website. It's emccoaching.me. And um, those are the great places to start. Mm. We'll have those down below. And Eric, thank you very much for taking all this time today to come and have a chat with me about human connections i had an absolute blast i could keep going but i sit here i'm sitting here and watching the clock and i'm like, probably have to stop that <laughs> otherwise we're gonna have to just do a part two yeah i i understand no this is this is a blast i appreciate you having me on and um this is a passion of mine i love love human connection and i love it when people identify their power in order to go out and create more connection in their world So uh, thanks for having me on.